Well, precious, precious family, what a time for us to be together, our broken hearts, our open hearts. So let's pray and just get into the word in a way that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit needs right now. Lord, we thank you for, oh, for what's in your heart right now. We thank you for what's in your heart. We long to be so in tune that your word will break the cedars, will devastate, will reform, will bring forth, will do the work you need to do in us right now. Well, we don't put any confidence in our wisdom, in our righteousness, in our Bible knowledge, in anything. <laughs> Lord, we humble our hearts before you. We are so desperately, desperately needy. We open to you, don't open to it. It's not a class. We open to the word of God, the ministry of the spirit. We open to you, Lord. Have your way. Father, have your way. Son, have your way in us. Holy Spirit, have your way. For Jesus' sake. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We're in the book of Daniel. I have, in fear and trembling, based on my own need for Jesus, in the ways that God is dealing with our body here, a new creation, and particularly in the area of pro-self, I, am, I, I am, have these big old logs in my eyes. I don't have any room to look for a speck in anybody else's so boy oh boy sharing these things i just come to you with a broken heart and we're just together seeking the lord and that is true that is so true before the lord from my heart to yours let's just be together and let his word and his spirit do the ministry i just humble my heart before you and with you before him so let's get into the word i sought the lord diligently um, not that that's earning anything, but in fear and trembling, just to hear from his heart the things that he wanted to speak, um, that it would be his word and his word and his words. And so I pray tonight you'll have a wonderful time with the Lord and his word and that it can, it can reach deep. I know that's what I'm believing for for myself. So let's go to Daniel. Let's open up to chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Our approach to this class is not teaching. Oh God, help us. Maybe right now we can just pray that the Holy Spirit, when we start going down that old path of um, hearing a teaching, that he'll just arrest our hearts and say, oh gosh, right now is not the season for teaching. Oh no. And and that we'll re-guide our hearts to, to the feet of Jesus, to the cross, to the dealing of God. Holy Spirit, we believe that right now for our, one another, for us as one and for our own hearts, that when we start listening with those ears of, of teaching or being puffed up or, you know, all those old paths, Lord, that keep us from the things you need of your firstborn through us, redirect our hearts, Lord, redirect. Holy Spirit, um, uh, pierce our heart, prick our heart help us. Some of these ruts have been formed so deep and so long that we're halfway down the river before we know that we're being carried away from him instead of into him. So pierce and prick us and help us for Jesus' sake to not allow us to be teaching. Amen. Amen. We're not looking at it as um, comprehending the history of God's people, although there is so much the Lord can minister um, do in us as we as we see that which he has laid forth in the Old Testament, but we're not learning history. It's a personal dealing right now. Okay, so let's go to Daniel chapter one and verse one. It says, "In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, 
came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, many people may think that's just a little sentence that just gives us historical content for the real meat of chapter one or the book that's coming later. But you know that Holy Spirit, he inspires people to write these things with great purpose. And that purpose has to do with the crucified and um, his sufferings, his nature in us. So let's look at that first verse. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in that year came good old Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. So to understand a little more of the importance of this king and why he is singled out as the one on the throne at the very time that Nebuchadnezzar has taken Jerusalem, there's a reason he's the one there. He represents something that can have an impact on us personally if we hear it with those ears. So what I'm going to do now is I've asked Lindsay to play a little video. It's a three minute video that I found on YouTube. It's gonna seem very uh, ridiculous, but if you can open your hearts beyond the cartoon itself into the history that it gives us very quickly about Jehoiakim, I really believe the Lord can minister and build something for the Holy Spirit to pierce our hearts and get us. I know he's been doing that with me, so I'm going to ask Lindsay to play this little video. After the wicked reign of King Amon, King Josiah was crowned king. He loved and obeyed the Lord. During his reign the book of God's law, which was thought to have been lost, was found in the temple. Josiah made sure it was read to the people of Judah. God raised up a prophet called Jeremiah to preach that unless they repented and obeyed, then God would send the Babylonians to take them as captives. Urged on by Josiah, Jeremiah and others, false idols and places of occult worship were smashed, but the people did not turn back to God with all their hearts. Josiah went into battle against Pharaoh Necho II and was fatally wounded by Egyptian archers. He was brought back to Jerusalem and died. Pharaoh Necho II intervened to put Eliakim on the throne in his place and changed his name to Jehoiakim. He would act as a puppet king to do what the Egyptians wanted and the people of Judah would pay the Egyptians tribute money. Jehoiakim worshipped false gods and became a godless tyrant who committed atrocious sins and crimes. The nation turned away from God and the prophet Jeremiah warned it was foolish to trust in the Egyptians to defend them. He preached that unless they repented, the Babylonians would invade and take them captive. Three years after becoming king, Jehoiakim heard the news that the Egyptians had been defeated by the Babylonians at the Battle of Carchemish. God told Jeremiah to write down all the prophecies he had given him over the years. A scribe called Baruch wrote down God's words on a scroll as Jeremiah dictated them to him. The Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar marched down the coast near Jerusalem to capture the Philistine cities controlled by Egypt. When Baruch finished writing the scroll Jeremiah said, I am forbidden to go into the temple. On the next day of fasting when the people of Judah are in the temple, read the words of the scroll to them. Baruch went into a room just off the upper assembly hall of the temple and read God's word to the crowd. Baruch was then invited to read the scroll to some of the top leaders. By the time he finished the leaders were frightened. We must tell the king they said. But they told Baruch and Jeremiah to go into hiding as they knew the king would not be pleased. The scroll was taken to King Jehoiakim in the winter house of his palace. He had a fire burning to keep himself warm. Jehudi began reading the scroll to the king. As Jehudi read each section of the scroll, King Jehoiakim removed it, burned the section, and tossed it in the fire. He repeated this until the whole scroll was burnt to cinders. Elnathan, Deleah, and Jemariah pleaded with the king not to burn the scroll, but he would not listen. He showed nothing but contempt for God's warnings. He sent men to arrest Jeremiah the prophet and Baruch but God hid them. Meanwhile King Nebuchadnezzar defeated the Philistine city of Ashkelon and then headed towards Jerusalem. Jehoiakim decided to surrender to King Nebuchadnezzar rather than see the Babylonians destroy the city. He changed his allegiance from the Egyptians to the Babylonians. He paid the Babylonians tribute from the treasury and gave them valuable artifacts from the temple. Some of the royal family and nobles were even handed over to the Babylonians as hostages. Jehoiakim continued to reign for another three years as a puppet king to the Babylonians. God told Jeremiah to dictate the words of the burnt scroll to Baruch again. A second scroll was written, which is found in the book of Jeremiah, to replace the one that was burned. The Babylonians tried to invade Egypt but were pushed back. 
Against all the warnings of Jeremiah, King Jehoiakim switched his allegiance back to the Egyptians. During this time Jerusalem was surrounded and its people were trapped inside, the siege lasted for three months. During the siege, King Jehoiakim died. The people took and threw the king's dead body over the city wall hoping the Babylonians would show them mercy. Jehoiakim's body laid on the ground until the siege ended. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so you can see from that um, little cartoon and the content therein that Jehoiakim was coming into a power. He was a puppet king uh, put on the throne by Egypt. Now, number one, I just want to mention, and again, these aren't teaching points or history points, but points that can be impactful to me as the Lord deals with me. Okay, Jehoiakim's dad was Josiah, one of the greatest kings of all Judah, um, probably second to David himself. So he had a wonderful father, um, but he, he was just so far from the Lord. Um, at the time of his reign, all the world powers were shifting from Assyria and Egypt to Babylon. It was a huge time of transition in the earth. And um, this king, this, this um, puppet king, but the king of Judah nonetheless, uh, was just tossed to and fro. He, was, he became the puppet king for Egypt. Um, and then after a while, he pledged his allegiance to Babylon. And that was only because that looked better to save his own life. To, he didn't do it to submit to the word of the Lord that was coming through Jeremiah. He did it because it was the best for him. It was the best for his comfort, for his, all these different things. It was a pro-self motive. And then at the end of his short 11 year reign, he switches back to Egypt, at which time the people come under siege from Babylon. And um, as you said, they cast his dead body over the wall to try to stop the Babylonian invasion, which did not work. So this man, this king, the guy who was on the throne, the government, of the man who sat on the throne of David was pro-self. All he wanted was to uh, align himself with the world power that would be the best for him to survive. This is the one who is supposed to understand the altar and the spirit of that throne more than anyone. Um, totally ungoverned. Um, Okay, aside from that, Jehoiakim hated Jeremiah. He hated Jeremiah. He hated Jeremiah's preaching. He hated Jeremiah's preaching. Why would he hate Jeremiah's preaching like the scriptures declare? Because Jeremiah was preaching to submit to Nebuchadnezzar to go into captivity and to bring forth the right spirit, um, fellowship in the Lord's sufferings, in those fiery trials, manifest the sun. I mean, he hated that. I want to stay here. I don't want my world shook upside down. I don't want turmoil. I don't want to have to submit in the spirit of Christ. I don't want to have to lay my life down. He was a pro-self king all the way. He hated Jeremiah's preaching for that reason. He hated his prophecies. And in fact, Jeremiah prophesied that he would be cast over the wall. <laughs> I will read the prophecy. Jeremiah prophesied Jehoiakim's death. That, you know, he cut and burned Jeremiah's prophecies to destroy them. When this king got his hands on that scroll, that Baruch had written the first scroll, and that was read to the king. Of course, Jeremiah and Baruch are in hiding. Every time, like that little cartoon showed, a portion of that scroll was read, he's cutting it. And when the whole scroll is read, he's burning it up. He's in his winter house. He's got this fire going. It's a fire. This is the king of Judah. There is a fire in his house. What does he use that fire for? to burn the prophecies of Jeremiah when he should have been burning in altar fire, fulfilling the word of the Lord for his people at that time. You know, he might have just liked Jeremiah as a person, but 
what that pro-self king felt against the word of the Lord. And you know, Jehoiakim may have loved Jeremiah's words if they were not impacting him right now, hitting him right where he was at. You know, everything was relevant with Jehoiakim. The whole earth was in turmoil. He couldn't figure out who to um, make allegiance with and union with. Didn't, doesn't matter who he makes a, a union with. He's supposed to be united to God. He's supposed to be in union, married, bearing the living God. But he, no, Egypt's fine. Egypt's just fine. In fact, Babylon is just as good. Whichever one will uh, make my life good, save me from suffering and keep me comfortable. Uh, I just, you know, I think Jehoiakim's biggest dilemma was, which one's going to make me happier, Egypt or Babylon? Hmm, Egypt or Babylon? This is the king. This is the king on the throne when God sends them into captivity. Um, the last days of Jehoiakim's life, like that little cartoon showed us, were spent under siege in Jerusalem. So he is put into a situation because he chose to align himself with Egypt at the end, where he is under siege from Babylon. And if you've read the book of Lamentations, you can get just a little feel of what that siege felt like to the people of God. It was horrible. They were it was horrible, um, horrible. And he's stuck in there with them, this man that was trying to avoid suffering and the altar, and he's stuck in there with those people. He doesn't know up from down. He's burned the scroll. He's tried to kill the prophet. He has no heart to lift up his eyes from <laughs> and See that redemption, that see that wedding feast. That's the book of Revelation he knit in with you. Lift up his eyes and see the king, a slaughtered lamb enthroned in the heavens, but meant to be enthroned on the throne of the hearts of God's people that are in the earth. That government was the one he should have joined to, but he only had a heart for the earth. He only had eyes to see what's going on down here and how does it benefit me? Which, which side should I take? Whichever side he took, he wasn't on the Lord's side. He wasn't united with the living God. He didn't lift up his heart, lift up his eyes and say, glory to God, now's my time. Now's my time to show him I'm with him. I'm one with you, yes, not doctrinally. Hallelujah. Oh, what an opportunity he missed. And instead of being like the, the two witnesses in Revelation 10, the earth's a shaken and a quaking, and there they are, spiritually, pouring out that slaughtered lamb, pouring it out, pouring it out. And their dead bodies lay there, and people party over them. But it's the spirit of life that's going to raise them back up after three and a half days. Jehoiakim's dead body lay in the midst of his people who were under siege and had no understanding that they belonged to the living God above the earth. They were one with the living God. They could have had a revival under siege, a revival of the slaughtered lamb and the altar fire and a releasing of burnt offerings through the people. That's real. Revival of the altars of releasing Christ in crisis. He could have led them in that. What an opportunity that would have been in the siege. Oh, this is the best time we've had as a people. We're surrounded on every front, but lift up your eyes, people. We're one with the living God. He's our king. He's our life. He's our bread and our water. It's sure. Isaiah prophesied of such things. In chapter 36, or there are thereabouts. He prophesied of what should be happening under siege when a heart is lifted up and is being written into the Lamb's Book of Life and is at the Lamb's wedding feast and is joining with the true king and his government so that the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, not Egypt, 
Babylon. Which one? Which one? Which one? I don't know. I, I've got nothing. Oh, I'm stuck. I made the wrong choice. Oh, oh, we're under siege. What do I do? It's a crisis. They just threw his dead body out. They just threw his dead body out. No spirit of life to raise it back. Just a crisis. And the king of Judah, who sat on the throne of David, and was the second son of Josiah, just a corpse, no spirit of life, no word of God. Jeremiah was his prophet, no leading the people to the altars of the Most High God, to the throne of the slaughtered lamb, to the communion feast of the wife they were meant to be. He failed them. He failed God. He failed his purpose. He failed their purpose. And so, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Okay. And this is Jeremiah's prophecy. It's Jeremiah 22, I think it's 18 and 19. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, oh, my brother, oh, sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, oh, Lord, ah, oh, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of a donkey, drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. No honor to this that would separate from the Lord. Daniel chapter one, let's go to verse two. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, that's Nebuchadnezzar's hand, with part of the vessels of the house of the Lord, which he carried into the land of Babylon, into the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So the Lord gave, the Lord gave. Wow, you'd think it was Jehoiakim who caused all this or did this or, but the Lord the Lord was Lord. He is in control and he gave Jehoiakim into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And he gave those vessels that were carried away in that first deportation in 605 BC of which Daniel was. He gave Daniel and he gave those vessels, those young men and women that were carried away in the first deportation around Joy, Jehoiakim's time. God gave them to Babylon with purpose, with purpose, so much purpose, so much purpose. God did it. God did it. God did it. God did it. God, man didn't do that. God did it. God did it. God was stirred up. Have you ever felt like God is stirred up? I've never felt like God was stirred up more than I feel it right now. Never. That's just me personally, but I've never felt it so strong in my life. God was stirred up. God was moving. God was behind the shaking earth and the shifting kingdoms. God had something in his heart. God had something in his heart. God had something in his heart that only Jeremiah seemed to be in tune with. God. What about Babylon? What about Assyria? It was, it was such a big power for so long. What about Egypt? It's coming. What about these kings and the sieges? And what about all these other little things that are happening? And what, a, what about God? What about his heart? What about the Lord gave? What about King of Kings and Lord of Lords? What about God? God had something in his heart that only Jeremiah seemed to be in tune with. Over a hundred years earlier, Amos, the prophet Amos, a prophet from Judah, from the south, that prophesied to the north. A hundred years ago, they were a little upset at him for prophesying. They said, go back home. Don't tell us what to do. He said, I am not a prophet. I am not a prophet or even a son of a prophet. But in chapter one of Amos, Amos, felt the roaring of the Lord's heart 
for Zion and out from Zion two years before the earthquake came. Two years before the judgment came on Israel and the Assyrian captivity and dispersion. Two years before anything manifested in the earth. Amos felt the roaring, the roaring of the Lord. A roaring that didn't manifest in the earth until two years later. But Amos heard it and he was in tune with the Lord. His name means God's burden. Jeremiah was in tune with the Lord. He was in tune with the Lord. Why things were quaking and a shaking. It wasn't the earth that was a quaking and a shaking first. It was God's heart. God's heart. For his son was a quaking and a shaking. And that's way bigger than anything that will ever happen in this world. Read the book of Revelation. It's all about one thing. And it's not down here. It's up there. And it's meant to be in here. There's a time to learn about it as a teaching. There is a time to say, oh God. Right here. Right here, Lord. Your son and this altar. This Jerusalem. He wasn't looking for the earth to answer his questions. He was looking into the heart of God. Not even his teachings, but his heart. Read Jeremiah in his prophecies. He wasn't understanding Assyria or Egypt. We talked about this. I'm reading my notes, but we've talked about this. Egypt and which one to join to. Jeremiah and Daniel in his prophecies to come will realize there's one beast with many heads. But I want to know the Lamb. Jeremiah knew who the people of God were to be joined with and had forsaken days without number like an unfaithful wife. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 20 says, You have been like a faithless wife who leaves her husband. You know, Daniel was a, just a teenager. And he was raised with Jeremiah's prophecies. We know that Daniel searched the scroll of Jeremiah because in chapter 9, he, he figured out the 70 days from searching Jeremiah's scroll. He, he, he knew uh, the word of the Lord that was coming out of Jeremiah about the heart of God for his people. Or like his wife, his habitation. Oh my, the tenderness that we find in so much of Jeremiah the weeping prophet. There's, there's so much of the Lord's heart revealed in these words he spoke. And Daniel heard them. He heard them. Oh, blessed God, he heard them. And he was also, uh, I'm sure, influenced by Josiah, who left such an imprint on Jeremiah. Of course, we have the very son of that man so far from his heart, and that must have impressed Daniel as well. What influences he had. What a time he lived in. What seasons in the earth drew him up to the heavens. Hallelujah. Oh, let it be with me, Lord. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Mm. Let's see. All the kings, false prophets, and most of the people. This is the climate of the first deportation of which Daniel was a part. All the kings and false prophets and most of the people were caught up in the shifting powers in the earth, the turmoil surrounding these conflicts, the injustice, the hardship. Most approached it all from a pro-self viewpoint. Like Jehoiakim, as an inhabitant of the earth. Oh, what does Revelation have to say of these inhabitants of the earth? It will be profoundly important in the book of Daniel, but more importantly in the book of my own heart. Rather than being, uh, huh, they approached it all from a pro-self viewpoint like Jehoiakim as inhabitants of the earth, rather than those that were joined with the slain lamb above. They did not look up when these things came upon them like Jesus tells us to do, but rather began to be cast into a furnace of upheaval and loss and suffering, which only exasperated the pro-self spirit. And then they were sent to Babylon where things became much easier. Things were about profit and gain and ease. And that also fed the pro-self spirit. In Ezekiel chapters eight to nine, we see at this time period, a vision of the Lord being driven out of his temple because of the defiling spirit 
that the people allowed to remain within them, in their imaginations, in their inward parts, in the deeper chambers of the temple, where a defiling spirit was hidden and worshipped and idolized. These are the things, the climate, the prophecies about around the time of Daniel. Years earlier, we hear Jeremiah crying out, Say not the temple of the Lord. Say not the temple of the Lord. Say not the temple of the Lord. This is before Ezekiel has a vision in chapter 8 through 10. God's saying, I'm not interested in religion. Don't call it the temple of the Lord. If the slain lamb isn't enthroned in the pro-self spirit is. God gave not only Jehoiakim into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar in the land of Babylon, but also some of the vessels of his house, which included Daniel. We, we spoke of this. So God brought them to Babylon again with great purpose to begin to open up this great purpose that was in God's heart when all these things were happening in the earth and Daniel was swallowed up of them, gathered into it. Uh, we need to look to understand that great purpose, what the word of God says about Babylon. For in Babylon, Daniel will be given, in Babylon, Daniel will be given a full meal pass to the king's portion of meat and drink. He will be drinking from the king's cup if he wants to, and he can eat all the king's meat he wants to. He's been given this. And although that seems innocent enough, it's the first thing that we're confronted with in Daniel chapter 1. It's the first test. It's the first test. And although this may seem innocent enough, let's see what the scriptures say about drinking from Babylon's cup. And let's see what the scriptures say about partaking of Babylon's spirit. And I want to say before we look at these verses in Jeremiah and Revelation on Babylon, that this little... Uh, heart note, to remember that God put Eve and Adam, Adam and Eve, into the garden, but God also put a serpent in the garden. God put the serpent, and our, our pastor Randy has shared this many, many times over the years. God put that serpent there with purpose. And God put Daniel in the king's court with access to all the king's food with purpose. A purpose that was in the heart of God from the beginning. So let's look at some of these scriptures. We're going to start, and you might want to open your Bible. I'm sure your Bibles are open. Go to the book of Revelation, and if you want to follow, it really is going to be a help to read the verses, because we're going to read a lot of scriptures here. And I'd just like to mention, noting where it speaks of the cup, um, in these verses, as we are looking at Daniel drinking from the king, having the opportunity to drink from the king's cup and eat from the king's table. I don't know how far we're going to get with this tonight, but we'll, we'll start. Okay, Revelation chapter 17, and we're going to start with verse 1. Um, the title in the Bible that I was printing this um, chapter out from has this subtitle, The Woman and the Beast. And I'll tell you... When, when I saw that subtitle, I almost just wanted to start crying. Just the woman and the beast. Oh, man. Okay, so verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come here, I will show unto you the judgment of the great harlot that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants. Remember, we're talking about the inhabitants of the earth. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with her wine. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. I heard Randy sharing in, in one of the Revelation classes, he said something that almost sounds like the tabernacle or, or the high priest. I can't remember which one he said, but arrayed in things that look like a priest or a tabernacle. 
so full of abominations. And on her forehead was written the name, Mystery Babylon, 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 Babylon. To a Jew, that's going to hit some nerves. Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations in the earth. And I saw this woman. Now we're talking about getting an opportunity to drink from a cup of the king in the earth. I saw this woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, and this is John, I marveled with great admiration. John in his 90s was deceived by the dazzle of this great harlot. Now, if John can be deceived by the spirit of Babylon, I know that I can be. I know that I can be. The angel said unto John, why are you marveling? I will tell you the mystery of the woman, verse 7, and the beast that carries her. Verse 8, and the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Here we go. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. They that dwell on the earth whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb from the foundation of the world. These are the ones who wonder at the Babylon spirit. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. These, verse 13, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. And this is, this is, this is, this is the big one. These shall make war with the lamb. Who, who is these? Who are these, these? These are those who dwell in the earth, whose names are not written, written, written into the Lamb's book of life. These are those who have one mind to give their power and strength to the Babylonian spirit. These, these make war with the Lamb. Let's go to chapter 18 of the book of Revelation. And this one is called Babylon is Falling. And again, we're still looking at the situation in Daniel chapter 1 about him being offered the king's cup and the king's portion. Babylon, the Babylonian king's cup, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his cup and his portion. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird for all the nations have drunk the cup of wine. All the nations have drunk her cup of wine, the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Once again, this is about a spirit that might be at work in me. It's not about stuff down here to distract me from what God's trying to get done in me right now. God forbid I let that stuff turn my gaze away from what God needs to do in me and that spirit having any hold in my heart. None of this matters. This is all that matters. I have eyes for nothing else. Verse four, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, be ye not partakers of her sins, that you receive not her plagues. For her sins have reached heaven. God remembers her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, double unto her double, according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled to her double. How much, verse 7, how much she hath glorified herself. Boy, if that isn't a pro-self spirit. And lived deliciously. 
for she said in her heart, I sit a queen. I'm no widow. I shall see no sorrow. Therefore her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly consumed with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. How many people believe that strong is the Lord God who judges the Babylonian pro spirit? The word of God says it's true. Isn't it funny here that she shall be utterly burned with fire? Even though she resisted going into the flames by the spirit of the firstborn son and being consumed as a burnt offering, a sweet savor to God, a life-giving spirit to others, she lived for self, resisted that fire, and at the end of the day, she's burned up in judgment. No savor, no life, no eternal communion, just judgment. Judgment. Verse 9. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise, we can't profit by that spirit. We can't gain, we can't increase ourselves with silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and thine wood and all metal of vessels. What does this sound like? Vessels of most precious wood and brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointment and frankincense and wine and oil. And it sounds like the tabernacle, everything that should be gathered to give God a home, everything that was gathered in to, for the people of God to give habitation to the living God and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses, horses and chariots. He said, hamstring your horses and chariots. No, we don't. And slaves and the souls of men all that that was meant for the lamb to have a place in the earth and his people. She is taken for herself. Slaves, the souls of men, God's tabernacle and God's people taken for self. Wow. Strong is the Lord that judges that. Verse 20. The saints rejoice, rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone. Now, I'm not going to go into this right now um, because it's the sake of time, but we're going to discuss the millstone. And um, I won't give a spoiler alert on it, but it has to do with the judgment of that spirit. Okay, so let's go to Jeremiah for the sake of time, 51. I think we're going to run short. We are. All right, so... Uh okay so verse six jeremiah he's prophesying here it's the end of his book 51 he's only got 52 chapters he's ending his prophecies with babylon for the most part verse six jeremiah 51 6 flee out of the midst of babylon flee don't casually walk don't kind of play with it run for your life out of the pro self spirit and deliver every man his soul be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Verse 7, Babylon has been a golden cup where in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken, all the nations have drunk of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Oh, let's just keep going with the Babylon spirit. Maybe what we can do um, is, is look, is read about this spirit. And, um, and then we, maybe next time we will discuss what this spirit looks like in our lives of drinking the cup and eating the, and eating the king's portion, what it looks like in our story, in our daily story. And that if Daniel saw that for what it was, if he saw like Eve did not see in the garden, but ate and partook of the, of the snake's temptation. If Daniel really saw what was being um, presented to him in Babylon, flee 
and he, he responded properly, and we're, we're going to go into those verses about him not defiling himself, but it's not, it's me, it's me that needs to not defile myself. I'm the one who needs to see this spirit for what it is. I am the one who needs to be mortified with the reality of what this spirit looks like in the eyes of the living God, and strong is he who judges it, and what it looks like in the eyes of the prophets and the martyrs, and what it looks like in the eyes of those under the altar, and what it looks like in the eyes of the spirit of the living God. I need to see it from their view so that I can flee from the midst of it. I don't need to learn about it. I don't need to be convinced. I need to see it in relationship to me. We will not see, we will not flee until we see. The Lord told me that from the beginning, starting with a verse in Matthew 24, and this was weeks and weeks ago. He said, you will not flee until you see. We're gonna look at that in all over Daniel, but I believe it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phrase from the Lord. You won't flee until you see, I see. I'm speaking of myself, until I see how vile the spirit is to the heart of, to, to the Lord, to his spirit, what, what war it does against his lamb, what war it does against his, his martyrs it speaks of, the blood of his saints. It's not just a little thing. I want it to be as big in my heart as it is in my father's heart. And I want to come under the conviction of the Spirit as deep as he, he feels it on the behalf of the Godhead and the body of the Lamb. I don't want to let go of any, any bit of them. I don't want to miss, I don't want to deceive myself or minimize anything. I want to see from their eyes and I want to be with them in their judgment and I want to be with them in their spirit. I want to be with them as I flee. I want to flee to them, out from and unto, unto. Come up here, come up here, and I will show you. Not the pro-self spirit, not Babylon, right? But the, the lamb, I want to see. I want another spirit. You know, that's why Daniel and Revelation, they're just so close together. They're like the uh, two testaments hugging one another and saying, we agree in one. And praise the Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for these incredible gifts of your word, oh, Lord. Oh, how we love them, how we love you. We thank you, we need you, we need these words. We need them more than words. Oh Lord, like David found them to be, oh Lord, let the word find entrance in us. Let it be a double-edged sword, Lord. Let it pierce between joint and marrow and motive and intent and seek out that which is to be winnowed away and set aside as defiling dross and so the seed itself can be formed for the lamb, Lord to be enthroned, to be government, to be king, to be altered, to be burnt up in us and released as a firstborn in sacrifice. Oh Lord, these things aren't teachings. They're not quick, quick little, cute little, neat little deep things. These are, the, this is your heart, Lord. This is your heart. This is your heart, Lord. This is your heart, Lord. Oh Lord. So I'm just going to read a few more scriptures on Babylon, and I think we need to meditate on it before we just jump to the end. When we come back together again next time, if the Lord permit, if it be good in his sight for us to come together, then we'll discuss what that looks like in our lives. And we can pray and we can seek the Lord together and cry out for one another, but most of all for his heart in one another, for his needs in this body, in this people. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the tenor of your heart. We thank you for the desires that your spirit has now to work deeper in us than ever before, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would use this time and these verses concerning the spirit of Babylon to uh, reach the mark that they're meant to reach in us, Lord, to do the preparatory work for us to see what it really is, Lord, so we can flee to the Lamb and Him and His feast, His table, His portion, His blood, His nature, His eternal spirit. So Father, we stop now, we bow our hearts, we bow our lives, our minds, and we, give, we just give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, thank you, and God bless you.